Hi, Steve Jones with the Hardscape Channel, back again with Mike Flad. How are you? Keep shaking your hand. That's it's like okay. You, you didn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, we're doing a second interview with you today because you have a, a unique um, job in that you, in addition to your private business, that you also work for the St. Louis County Parks. Parks. Mm -hmm. Correct. Can you give me a little more background on the, the scope of what you do and how hardscapes, you affect hardscapes involvement in the planning and implementation within the Parks Department? Sure. Uh, we're, in, we're a pretty large system. We have about uh, 55 parks and about between 15 and 18,000 acres of parkland. So what I'm involved with is to myself and two other landscape architects, we kind of oversee the design and master planning, if you will, for most of our park system. And part of that master planning is to facilitate new uh, buildings and new playgrounds and new parking lots. So how this hardscape fits into what we would normally consider an average design might be we might be using pavers that are going to uh, allow less runoff going off site. We might want to have more infiltration in, into the system within the park and to capture that. So integrated parking permeable, lots, permeable, permeable stuff? Permeable stuff, yes. Um, parking lots, uh, we have a combination of materials that we like to use. We have to be um, readily available to have you know, snow plowing done, and just our general maintenance. So we do a lot of that type of thing within St. Louis County Parks. We have our own crews that, that do all of our maintenance in terms of paving and hardscape. So as an example, if I have a, uh, a playground project, let's say, and there's a new parking lot, I might end up using asphalt for the drive for the drives. I might end up using pavers for part of the walkway system going from the drive or parking lot to the playground. And we look at the the scale of, of the materials so that we're going, you know, more into the human scale as we get into the, the park a little bit more, especially around the playgrounds. Um, and as we get closer to the playgrounds, then of course we then have to transition into the actual playground itself, which usually is a rubberized material for safety. But uh, my involvement is to kind of conceptually come up with these ideas, and then I oversee the design and construction, and do the specifications and contract documents and so forth. Who deals with vendors? We do it all. <laughs> we do it all. So. Uh, it, it's up to me to make sure that I'm choosing the right materials for its proper application. But this forces you to put it into a bid situation, correct? It's a, always a low bid item. So here we go. <laughs> it, this, this comes down to, you know, price, price, and price. Uh, sometimes we don't always get what we would like to use, but uh, that's part of the game with uh, government. Is, yeah, well, obviously you're the steward of the tax dollars, mm -hmm. and, you know, unfortunately we wish more people did a better job of that. But um, people that are worried about bringing value, and value is a combination, in my opinion, anyway, is, a, is a combination of co quality of product, longevity, long-term return on that investment. Absolutely. So I see when I see low bid on some projects, it always bothers me because I can I can see during construction that it's destined for early failure. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's pretty much across the board with governmental agencies, unfortunately. Uh, How do you deal with that? Can you deal with that anyway in the specifications? Yes, we the specifications we can write them as tight as we possibly can to get a certain product. Okay. So if, uh, if I just want to use one of the specific pavers, I have to look at all the PSI and all the various uh, aspects, you know, that I have to be looking at to make sure that we're getting exactly what we want. Certainly. 
Well, it sounds like Bill's uh, on, on call today, huh? <laughs> I, I, I think so. I think so. <laughs> well, you know, um, what could you... Now, another question I had for you was uh, when you have young contractors, young starting to work into the commercial field. Right. It's, and I was there once. I, you know, it was not a comfortable thing for me. It was, a, it was a very, it was, it was very difficult. And I would, I would ask you to maybe share with some of the young contractors that are watching this, what they might do, um, you know, to to make a better presentation for themselves, if they were going to approach the municipal commercial field. Yeah, you know, um, first of all, I think a picture is worth. Thousand words, and so I think what a contractor needs to do is to bring in to a county agency or a governmental agency a book of projects that he's worked on and references, because I will call at least one or two references on every contractor that I'm ready to go in under contract with. So. It might not be the scale of which we're looking at, but sometimes those same applications fit in a small design as, as well as a larger one. So when you're looking at somebody's references, and I've seen all sorts of them from different companies, um, and even back when I had to prepare my own references, mm -hmm. I always included the ones I had to go back and fix. Absolutely. Because as far as references, my first question is, did the contractor fulfill his obligation to you as an owner? Is the product still standing the way it was designed? And was the person honest? And those are the three questions that I start every interview out with. Um, and usually that then walks me through a, a different process to find out a little bit more about that individual. Or when to cut it short and let him go. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> I've been there, I've seen that, I've done that too. Sure. Trying to find out the, the quality of the people you're trying to deal mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. So, um, what, what would you say to a young contractor, if you're talking to him now? Sure. What would you say to him? I mean, we talked about references and we talked about pictures, in other words, get the imagery and get good imagery. I found, uh, just to diverge a little bit, a few weeks ago, or it was actually around Christmas time, um, some guy used to work for me, a young guy, he's now in the tile business. And he got his girlfriend to set up a website for him, which is all great, and I was just, but the pictures were horrid. And I found out that he was using his cell phone camera yep. to take the pictures. Well, I felt bad that she had put the effort in to create the website, they had a camera, but it got abused and broke. So I ended up giving him one of my cameras, one of my older ones, but still a, a, a decent resolution camera. And I said, here, <laughs> do it right. And I talked him into going out and buying a good tripod, you know, and, and, and you know, the mount and everything for sure. it so that he could actually start to share his, his stuff. Well, image, image, image. So when a contractor comes in, his business card, the way he's dressed, doesn't have to be fancy. But, you know, looking at his equipment, you have a pretty good idea of whether that person's going to give you the right installation. Well, it's one of the reasons why we, we've, we're doing what we do with the Hardscape Channel. It's to allow people that opportunity to, when they've done something they're very proud of, is to post it up, upload it to, to the Hardscape channel on Facebook. Sure. We'd love to share it with people around the country. Yeah, that's what it's for. It's, uh, it's going to be our, it is Hardscape Industries central social media sharing point. Yeah. And hopefully we'll get you to upload to uh, some of your, your, your greater projects yeah. and successes. Hopefully that'll happen. That's good. Mike, thanks again. Okay. Appreciate it.